Oh, hi. hi. Hello. Welcome to episode 12 of Lawfully Chaotic. Uh, I hit the live I hit the live button and then not the confirm. <laughs> so, I'm glad I, I saw that. that. I Otherwise, that this, whole, this whole thing would have been just <laughs> you and me shooting the shit. Which it um, usually is, which is fine. Which it usually is, yeah. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Lawfully Chaotic. I'm Brian Weiss with RPG and Company, and uh, I have with me Jason Baldrick of TTRPG Academy. Uh, tonight we are going to start by uh, discussing uh, NPCs and how they can add uh, to your game. I'm sure we will go on many tangents uh, during that discussion. Um, any <laughs> announcements? Um, only thing I got is don't forget go over to Dogmite. I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch myself here go over to dogmite uh and enter for this awesome vanguard dice vault uh that i was lucky enough to collaborate um on with them it's uh rpg branding go to dogmite.com slash rpg and company i'm sorry rpg and co and uh enter to win that um i think that's all i got you got anything um i don't know um <laughs> You know, any it's, new, it's, you, uh, do you have any new games? How many games are you running a week now? I am, well, once, um, uh, let's see here. Once my, um, you know, it still won't let me host your Lawfully Chaotic Studios. It's so weird. Really? Oh, yeah. you know why? Because I probably created this broadcast through your production wow. channel instead of mine. Oh, that's right. Well, no, no, no. It's Twitch thing, no? right? So Twitch should allow me to Twitch should allow me to host it. That shouldn't matter at all. So hmm. it, 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 sometimes I notice it delays a bit too. So oh well, maybe that's yeah, it. It's it's so weird. Um, it's so weird. Maybe one day we'll uh, I'll figure out how to use this uh, <laughs> this video thing. Internet. Are we own cops. Is it, is it, you filming me. Day. The other day, this internet tried to kill me. You understand me? The internet's evil. It, 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 it tried to kill me. Uh, uh, well, I, that you know, hey, that's a good segue into our topic. Um, I I saw that voice. I like that voice. I pride myself on doing accents and characters. I like that voice. I see that as like an old gnome working in a magical oddities shop or something like that. Well, I mean, so when you well, do NPCs, well, I'll start. I'll start it okay. out. When you yeah, when wait, you do wait, NPCs, wait. okay, go ahead. Go ahead. However, the elderly <laughs> gnome, the hoity-toity elf, and the English-accented guard; those are the three most are like, overused. I don't know if they're overused, but I'm wondering if they've become such a stable and reliable way of. <laughs> giving players an opportunity to know the difference between you know what the dm is doing through regular conversation versus yeah. oh i'm in a shop it's an elderly gnome who's a little bit you know kind of strange um does that mean i get to enjoy the npc or is the dm secretly trying to complete some sort of fundamental task you know so it's like which my players are my players are convinced that every single person that they meet, every NPC that they ever meet, is out to kill them. <laughs> well, let's talk about <laughs> which that ninety eight percent of the damage. time is true. <laughs> let's talk about that psychological damage because maybe that <laughs> maybe that's a fundamental problem. You know, I mean, what if um, if that's the case? Are we doing something wrong? With our NPC usage, if they feel that paranoid all the time? No. I mean, maybe from a psychological <laughs> standpoint, yes. But from a game standpoint and keeping them on their toes, fuck no. <laughs> My, I well, want them to feel like everybody is out to kill them all the time. Well, and I think, um, I think there's also a bit to say about... Um, I mean... It's funny oh. because when they actually meet somebody who's genuine, they like can't believe it. It's like, wait, so you're not actually trying to kill us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that that's a truism right there. That's a truism. Yeah. And I and 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 it begs the question. It begs the question. Um 
non-player characters, NPCs. Mm -hmm. Why are why is the word non even included? What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a good point. I've never, uh, to be honest with you, I've never thought of that. Non I is, see. Non is a negative, right? Non yeah. is a negative interpretive yeah. um, part of the language. They are clearly I... playing as our influenced character. Um, maybe they need a new moniker. Maybe they need that's a new a... kind of branded name that we haven't thought up of yet. That's a really, that's a really good idea. I think we should brainstorm it's, about it's that and immediately idea. trademark <laughs> It's a terrible idea. Designed Bullshit. I think we should come up with something, immediately <laughs> trademark it and buy the URL and then license it to everybody in this community. Every time somebody uses uh, our, the new word for NBC in their game in any capacity, we get a dime. <laughs> People are going to hate me. Hate me, hate me, hate no, me. No, that's, that's – I've never thought about it that way. That's interesting. I really um, – you know, maybe maybe back in the old days, you know, uh, back in the old uh, days, BC, when we used to play with just six sided dice, right? And you had to walk uphill backwards in the snow, even <laughs> though it never snowed in California. We still did it because that's what you did. You did it difficult, and right? you did it with a smile, motherfucker. <laughs> in D and D BC or D and D BCR uh, before code or before Critical Role. Um, I think I NPC. Know, I know what you did there. Right? You like that? That's trademarked. <laughs> trademarked before royalties. Um, I, I think that may have been more acceptable to 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 just refer to it as NPC because of the way people played. I think nowadays it's fair to say that you know there's been this this whole new uh, exploration into the depth of the game. Um, um, and I think more people now who play and who DM are looking for that um, immersive experience. I look at NPCs, uh, you come up, you have a really good point because I see NPCs as a way to allow the DM to be part of the narrative uh, and part of the game itself. Mm. And, and, and that may sound weird because obviously the DM is part of the game. But let's face it, a DM is really just a referee. It's the com it's the AI that you're fighting against, okay? It's the storyteller. But I feel that and, – and I'm not discounting the role of a DM by any means, okay? The AI is that's, – that's, that was terrible. Scratch that. We'll, I edit. we'll, we'll, we'll edit that out of this live broadcast. <laughs> I actually thought of a great name for NPC. What's that? The, net the narrative player character. Boom! Wait, because that's essentially what it is. Hold on, I gotta go to GoDaddy. <laughs> <laughs> on oh, my by the way, that's how that's how Brian actually types uh, on so, my keyboard oh, that you love. So, yeah, don't don't let him fool you. He actually types that way. I have proof. I have recorded <laughs> proof that he does it, that. This is true. Uh, that's my M60 keyboard <laughs> on full I auto. Think no matter what gaming system you play, right? No matter what gaming, there, yeah. with one exception. With one exception, there's been a sudden resurgence in solo RPG, like solo playing. Okay. Um, and there's been a there's a group that plays uh, uh, RPG games without a referee or without a GM, DM, or storyteller. Okay. Where the narrative of the players is self -re resolving within the context of the game. Wow. Um, I think for the most part, you just people, blew my mind, bro. Bro, like, I, I like this weed is not laced with anything but love. Um, I think that that as the schism will eventually permanently fade of the us versus them narrative, right? The uh -huh. idea that the goal is to beat the dungeon master yes. or game master or whatever gaming system you're playing. And it's more about the narrative experience of the game that you're in and the fun that you're having um, there, whether it's, you know, aliens, whether it's, you know, masquerade, whether it's, you know, that schism will eventually go by the wayside because what people are going to realize is that it's just not fun. That schism sucks. It's not as entertaining. There's maybe a handful of, you know, people out there that enjoy it. And I hope they continue to enjoy it because enjoying the game is part of the mental health aspect of things. But the reality is 
the popularity of Critical Role thematically is any game that you play where the table is enjoying the narrative, the only tool available to storytellers is the narrative PC, the or the you know the NPC if that's what you're if that's what you're focused on. Yeah, I, and, I I'm not going to add to that because I don't think I can I can say it better. I personally do not use NPCs in a way for self preservation of the campaign. Meaning... I use them as a way to drop threads of possibilities. But unless the players take those threads and run with them, I do not force them into it under oh, any Oh, I don't no, I don't think I I don't think I do either. My favorite um <clears throat> I gotta mount this somewhere else. Every time I move, my desk moves and then my whole microphone moves. <laughs> you gotta you, you gotta drop it off from the ceiling like mine. It's uh it's the California earth, earthquakes that we have here in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. By the way, here's a tangent, and I'll get back to what I say. So I finally it says experienced crotch mounted. <laughs> that would be moving all over the place, brother. <laughs> Three years ago was our last trip to LA um, for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, and by the way, next time I come out, we have to get together. Um, I think oh, this year we will yeah. be out there. But anyway, I finally experienced California earthquake last time we were out there. Um, crotch mounted. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I finally uh, experienced a California earthquake last time we were out there. We were at, um, well, one one of them, we were in the car, so we didn't even feel it. The other one was that it was like a 7.2 out in Bakersfield or something like that. But you realize how deep in the sticks Jason is. I don't know. I'm, where are I'm, you? I'm in the boonies. So there's, where are you? there's civilization and then yeah. there's me. Where um, are you? We're actually in the Inland Empire Riverside County area. But so we're can't. even on the fringe of that. We're in a place. We're in a place called Hemet, where the studio is. Okay. But me and Callista live in a place called Homeland, and Homeland. That sounds like something out of a role. Well, it sounds game. like a well. It sounds like a show on HBO Max. But Rivers, Rivers, <laughs> Riverside is northwest, right? No, it's very much east of LA. I'm sorry, uh, northeast, northeast. Yeah. Okay. Eh, basically, there's LA. Yeah. Everything south of LA is considered San Diego. Right. And everything north of LA is considered, it doesn't matter. Um, ECH. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> north of LA is just, it just doesn't matter. And then there's everything east, which is the kind of the frontier okay. of civilization. Like, okay. you know, well, where you can still ride your horse or ride your ATV gotcha. or shoot your shotgun. And gotcha. You know, well, live we on were, 13 acres without having to worry about encroachment. So this was so I think it was like a seven something out in Bakersfield. And we were at uh, what's the Japanese? Oh, I remember that one. What's the yeah. Japanese restaurant up on the hill by Magic Castle? Uh, Yoshimira or something like yes, that? Something like that. Yeah. I know yeah. So we're about, yeah. we're up there. And I mean, it was fucking cool as shit. I got to admit, it was really like interesting. It's a very surreal feeling. Remember how I said if it's north of Benny Ben <laughs> Benny <laughs> Remember how I said if it's north of LA, it doesn't matter. Yeah, Bakersfield is north of LA. I know that. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, back to the NPCs. Um, no, I think I think that's a really cool assessment. I don't use my. Well, no, that's not true. I would. I would. That would be a lie. I, I would say I'm. I am <clears throat> forty sixty forty percent. I use NPCs to to drive the campaign. Um, and although no, I'm gonna change again. <laughs> this, is, this is you're witnessing my mind at work. Everybody, now's the time to go get a drink or go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> the grind is real, the grind. my friend. No, the I grind. would say I I don't force um, NPCs uh, into the role of uh, driving the narrative. If I do find that happening. Then I just truly write them into the narrative, okay? And mm -hmm. I'm and I'm obviously speaking about a homebrew campaign, which I'm writing now. And I had a, it was actually the best side quest that I've ever had in all of my years of playing. Um, it was literally, uh, let's find something to do because one or two players were gone. So it was let's find a side quest to fill the night, and it became this four session story arc that just became so cool that I actually wrote it in 
to the weave of, of the whole story. So mm -hmm. I find myself doing that when I have an NPC that really, you know, is part of a cool story arc. Most of the time, though, um, what else can you do to drive a campaign? Um, and, and and this is an amazing D and D. He'll, he'll uh, DM. He'll tell. You, he'll self self deprecate it all the time, but he he's good. He's who? got the voice, and he's who? got the management skills. Me, uh, Vince. Oh, Vince. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I haven't been in one of your games yet, so I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to remedy that. Um, exactly. Um, but I use, um, I mean, I think hooks are the best way to drive a campaign, you know, and, and I think the best way to, to provide those hooks is through NPCs. But I think, uh, I love that name that you came up with, narrative player characters. I really do. I'm not just well, saying I mean, Because I think for me as a DM, it gives me a chance to quote unquote play, you know? But um, but aren't we already playing? Well, we are, but I mean, I don't know. Do you feel as a DM that even that sometimes you're, you know, you're a storyteller and you're, you are the, the facilitator of the narrative. Don't you find sometimes where you feel like you're just mechanical, you're there as a, a mechanical element? I maybe I'm don't... doing, maybe I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> well... No, I mean it's just, it's it's definitely an established question because of the way we presume our behavior within the context of the game. Like to Vince's point, well, how else do you drive a campaign? You drive That's the campaign. Your so, you know, so Vince, you're saying your favorite part is the mechanics. Well, you, I, I I think I, what he's saying is is that as he's feeding off the way the players are responding. Mm -hmm. to the way the game is going you kind of use that as a way to kind of like you know gauge you know how you can steer them in a direction that mm -hmm. fits the story that you're trying to play out in your mind you know like there's a story there's a narrative story there's something going on the reality is is that because it's going on i want i want the players to to enjoy my story that I've written. Therefore, I'm going to use NPCs. I'm going to use side hooks and quests and mechanics mm -hmm. to encourage them to go that route. Yeah, no matter how you cut it, that's kind of a rail. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? But I also, I don't, I, I don't do any of that. Okay. I, I mean, I, I do. And I also and kind I of use, but I think to your point, that's how we get to play. Right. Yeah. So I think the fact that you do it is a way that you play, but it also maintains the integrity of the table. Yes. Right. And the, the idea of continuity. I do it the way I do it because that's how I feel like I get to play. Okay. So, I mean, I think it answers the question universally. Well, I do both. We're, we're always playing. Yeah. We're always yeah, playing. Yeah. Fair enough. But I, I do both. I, I, for me, it is a chance to be in character to interact with, with the players, you know, in a more player like manner. Um, certainly it is also to add depth to my world. I mean, I have NPCs when I create, you know, I've said it before, still one of my favorite things to do is shopping. In fact, half of our session last night was shopping for shit and it was awesome. Um, well, and I the think reason I you love know, shopping is that it presents so many opportunities for hooks. Exactly. Exactly. I and I also like it. <laughs> I also like it because that's a that is an opportunity to introduce a character that may even show up again. I mean, look at uh, look at Gilmore or um, or Pumat, you know. Well, I, I actually use um, in one of my other campaigns in my Worlds Apart campaign, I use um, Gilmore's glorious get goods, um, but it's no longer it, it's so far in the future that he's no longer alive, but the store is still there. Oh, and the there, so there you go. The, and the, the person running the store is a, you know, a long distant relative called Gloria. Mm -hmm. right? So it's now called Gloria's glorious uh, goods. It's called Gloria's glorious goods. Um, because I like the glorious, overall glorious, narrative. Gloria, Gloria's glorious, glorious, glorious goods, glorious, glorious yeah. goods. Say that five times yeah. fast. The, the three G's. <laughs> <laughs> Gilmore's glorious goods. 
But my the way I love to use NPCs is to dangle a dozen threads in front of people. Mm -hmm. So that as they pull each of those threads, it garners opportunities of their response to the to, to the idea of what they think or what they're doing. Thematically, NPCs for me are the greatest way to challenge a player's morality. And, and oh, I feel yeah. that challenging a player's morality through an NPC is a mm -hmm. great way to give the, the player an opportunity to see that as an opportunity to either take the thread bypass this thread or do something else entirely with the thread or um, or release their inner murder hobo well i mean which is a could. tiny seed in everybody <laughs> well yeah and they and they conceptually could do that but almost <clears throat> every player that sat at my table has sat through a zero session with me and they know how dangerous that really is yes yeah. I, I apologize for the the pack of dire wolves running through the hinterlands <laughs> there <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I mean as a tool, right? So yeah. as a ubiquitous tool and an offering an option for a DM to enjoy the play, absolutely. Narrative yeah. PCs are predominantly a key function of the campaign, of the yes. mechanic. Um it also begs the question, does a narrative PC and a big bad really have anything in an uncommon reality? I mean to me, I don't really have big bats. I call them bosses for the purposes of milestones. Mm -hmm. But those milestone points are essentially narrative PCs as well. And of course, the, I mean, look at look at Strahd. No well, but that's I mean, he's got to be the culmination of, you know, the I've never enjoyed Strahd because I think he's the worst trope in the world. <laughs> And he's a horrible the whole fucking game is a trope. You no, know, it doesn't have to be because thematically you can play any game you want. Therefore, the narrative PC approach can be in any thematically formed yeah. way that you want. Yeah. To me, the most dangerous person is the one that you don't know what they're going to do. The one from that a, just sits on the sideline and watches and waits and watches. From a player waits. standpoint? From a from a narrative player from oh, an yeah. NPC perspective, right? Okay. Because, and you yeah. can evolve them that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have to admit something. In one of my games, there is an NPC who is actually the big bad, and no one they've they've met him before, they've interacted with him before, and it's in one of my games, one of my see, Twitch games. See, I love that. That's also how I use NPCs is to I guess in that I guess in that regard I do use them to drive the narrative more than I than I think because I do like I like that old you know like oh it was the the, the, the mother <laughs> God, God damn right they and, do. And Cesare hates legendary action. <laughs> oh, of course he does. Of course. Um, let me see. DC strength check 25 or he rips my head off. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Let's let's do it. Um but uh I, I love that old like, oh, it would the butler did it. God, we you know, I mean, you know, he's been uh I, I like that twist, so I, I try to uh utilize that a lot. But I well, just I really like I think for me, the best uh, the best act, act, aspect of narrative player characters. So now this is this is now a term. Okay, mm -hmm. you heard it here it's first. I think what this is the seventh time we've said it. So yep. after seven times, it becomes canon. It becomes real. Yeah, um, I think <laughs> no the best. <laughs> I th it becomes real in this imaginary fake game. Um, I think the best, I, I mean, I mean, this is pretty obvious, but some of call Oxford. <laughs> Hang on. Let me, let me, let me reach out. <laughs> um, I think the best use of NPCs is, um, is to elicit good role playing from characters. You know, yes. when you, when you can really show them a, um, you know, a deep um, character and interact that way. Um, to me, that is the best tool uh, to to get good role players to engage, um, and then to get uh, players who maybe are not as comfortable role playing um, to maybe do it in a in a safer environment. 
Do you um, ever fall in love with your NPCs? Like, I've created something really... Like, I've like, created something really cool, or like, I want to date this person. <laughs> like, fall in love with it within the concept of the campaign. Like, you really yeah. don't want anything to happen to it. <clears throat> oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, that one side arc, um, it's kind of convoluted, but there's a couple characters in there, and uh, I, I, actually, I love it. I really love it. And like I said, now it's part of the main story of this homebrew campaign. I don't know if I've ever experienced that emotion yet. <clears throat> Maybe I... you need to develop better NPCs. Or empathy. Empathy's good. Um, maybe you should. Maybe. Why don't you get some empathy? <laughs> you heartless bastard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like love. Love. What the fuck is love? That's, that's why another, it was like, like I want to date this word. person. I, I mean, I did create this elven <laughs> shop owner and she was hot, man. ASAP. Well, I'm calling Callista. <laughs> damn it. Callista's probably watching. I hope she's watching. Uh, maybe because she, she might have thought. She, well, she might have thought we were on the other channels, so she she could be watching any of the channels, for all uh, I know. Okay. Um, uh, but to that point, she would like to be on next uh, week. So. Oh my God! Um, absolutely. Yeah. So if you can set up. Join us three, for episode thirteen when we yeah, have a guest. And have a three camera setup because I I don't know if you have enough setups yet to accommodate that. I will. Otherwise, I will make she one. She would have popped on with us today, but I didn't want to break. I didn't want to break. You know. The setup necessarily no that yeah absolutely yes so we have that ready for next week that'd be ideal awesome. um, great because i think i want to i think when we you know talk about you know player characters and you know player characters in the role-playing world i think it'd be a great way to because i feel like talking about npcs is important so that when we talk next week about player characters and now mm -hmm. they view their role at the table will be a lot of fun with a player. Uh, see, I, can, think, I think I get... think player characters are completely superfluous to the whole to the whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the Tabaxi player, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Wrong one. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Fuck the you're, PC. You're typing too fast, Vince. <laughs> Oh my god, it's so true though. But I mean, it's so like, who are some of your favorite PC characters that you have? I'm trying to remember some that I've done. Um, some of my favorite NPCs. Yeah, or I think PCs. No, Different. no NPCs. You better say yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because I've never experienced the need to fall in love with an NPC. I've I've been very ubiquitous in my emotion towards them and how they exist within the homebrew world. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've created bizarre NPCs based on pop culture kind of influences, right? So I've created a Fizzbin before because I just love the eccentric old wizard who is super powerful, but yet is using very passive aggressive ways to steer people towards things that are very moralistic uh, jeopardies, I mm -hmm. think is a great way to encourage um, the immersion factor. Uh, you know, I loved using, uh, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, the Kender um, from the Dragonlance one. Oh, um, oh my God. Tasselhoff oh. Burfoot. Tasselhoff, so, yeah. You know, I love the Tasselhoff Burfoot character, and I use a lot of that pop culture. I love Gollum's sense. I love the naivete of Luke's character from the very first Star Wars film. Mm -hmm. Uh, not those garbage prequels, but the actual film. <laughs> um, and, you know, I I really love the idea. <laughs> he is. Um, I really love the idea of using all these pop culture personalities and then bake them on a baking sheet and, like, throw them, you know, mm -hmm. into, you know, into an NPC, into a narrative player character so that, when that narrative player character comes into existence, if they die or if something nefarious happens to them, I'm never going to cry over it because they're, the purpose is narrative points, uh, a narrative thread, or potentially, um, you know, an option that is presented. And if the players choose it, they don't, you know, and I also treat unique areas as NPCs, as narrative player characters. You know, like, 
a strange, mysterious valley can just be as much of an NPC as a shopkeeper. That's or, a good point. Yeah. Or a guard or, yeah. you know. How about sentient weapons? I love, I, I, that is a weakness for me. I love sentient weapons. That yeah, is me too. Weakness. I think, um, I, I know you were having a uh, conversation, you and, uh, you and um, Sharon were having a conversation about uh, alignment. Mm -hmm. And the general consensus is that alignment is a useless, um, a useless mechanic in the game. And for the most part, I agree with you. However, I think the one place that it could really come into play is sentient weapons. I love the. You well, know, I think a sentient oh, weapon can be an NPC. Absolutely. And I, think, and I think using alignment for an NPC definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. mostly because it gives you a basis of formula. Mm hmm. Or the overall behavior of that NPC and their mm -hmm. interpreted their interpretation of the world. But the problem is, once again, if you've got really skilled role playing players, like I consider you and Vince and Callista and and Cesare and Brandon, mm -hmm. you may have a kind of lawfully evil shopkeeper who is so heavily influenced. By your player characters how could they actually remain lawfully evil when something mm -hmm. might have changed their perspective or their understanding of the diatribe of what they think they were focused on versus something else you know so it's you know once again the only time i ever used a mechanic for alignment is that if people chose to use an alignment and they were doing something in conflict with their alignment then they had disadvantage. If they were doing something that was in a lot in tune with their alignment, then I would give them advantage. Yeah, one hundred percent. That was the only mechanic I ever introduced. Yeah, one hundred percent, Vince. I agree yeah, with you. It's all it so is. fluid. I just Absolutely. think I think with the weapon, the sentient weapon, it's it's cool because that can actually you know that can actually affect the player character, and it doesn't even have to be the label of alignment. It oh, can just and, be contrary. And how a weapon becomes sentient is yes. in interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got, I've got, I've, I, because I'm running so many games, I've got a little bit of that kind of smattered all over the place. So in a game that I run, a private game that I run on Tuesdays called Saloon's Gift, mm -hmm. um, it's based in um, Exandria. It's based along the Menagerie Coast, but it's uh, mm -hmm. many years post. Um, I do everything post critical role because it's just easier to handle the yep. content that way. Yep. Yep. Um, but I'll drop little things, right? I'll drop little things into the game based on sentience. So there's um there's um Sam Regal's character. Why am I drawing a blank on that right FCG. Now? Uh no, no, the other one. Uh not. Uh no before that. Um season one. Vox oh. Machnia. The one that redid the entire narrative of using a gnome as a bard. Oh, for fuck's Stanley sake. Stanley Shorthall. Total... Thank you, man. Thank you. Jesus um, Christ. So I introduced an alchemy bag called Scanlan's uh, Bag of Randomness. And you put your hand in this bag and you pull out once a day a random alchemy potion. Uh -huh. But you never know what it's going to be. Yes, so I love I built, shit like that. You know, but it was based on the fact and they haven't learned this lore yet and they may never because they haven't really investigated it. Um, but the reality is that bag was made by Scanlan. It was imbued by Dorolo and together was their first attempt at manufacturing something that was supposed to be part of Scanlan's personality. And it ends up getting lost, you know, it just gets lost into the ethers of the crazy world. And now these folks have a sentient bag that they don't think is sentient. They don't know it's sentient yet. I love that. And really it's a fragment of Scanlan's personality that was imbued into the bag. And somewhere out in a Faerun pocket is this evolved fragment of Scanlan who is building these potions once a day and putting them on shelves. <laughs> and from his view, he looks up to see a large hand come into the bag and uh -huh. he picks a potion really quick off the shelf 
and crams it into people's hands when it oh comes. Oh my into god, the I fucking love that. That's <laughs> awesome. I they love, don't know that yet. They I love know. chaotic magic. You remember oh, when I, I was saying? Magic. Remember when I was talking to you about uh, uh, entering your campaign, Debtor's Gambit, and I was like, mm, I'm kind of going back and forth between a war mage and a sorcerer. If you will allow me to roll as many times as possible on the wild magic chart, I'll go sorcerer. <laughs> I, I, I usually like so brandon has a wild magic barbarian mm -hmm. and i built a custom table for him and he yeah. rolls on a custom table yeah that, well you had me rolling on that too i yeah. just i love the most i mean if you look at most of my homebrew magic items it's it's oh i love your yeah this is really item. pop this is really powerful but you could kind of get fucked up using this thing I love well that and i i the other thing I, I enjoy doing with the NPCs is I make them so unique that people can't predict what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so in one of the other games, Denizens and Masters, um, they had come to a major crossroads town and finally had some downtime. And of course, they immediately get into a bar fight because these two new steel golems that are part of a new kind of like part of the arc that's playing out um, were they thought they were hunting down the queen, but no one knows the queen is traveling, uh, which is the bright queen. Uh, it turns out that one of the player characters was the target of these things. Um, so chaos ensues. Great narrative theater of the mind bar, bar fight breaks out. Um, and then they go riding, they go running and hiding in a relic shop. Of course, what they don't know is that it's a cursed relic shop. So it's twin. It's twin is the happenings. shop cursed or are the relics cursed? Or both? The, the, sh the shop is. Okay. And really, it's the outcome of two of twin halflings that fought, and one of them killed the brother, the twin brother. And Oh, my it, God. It caused a curse to happen. You just gave me an un... I got to write this down for real. <laughs> this is not fake typing. You just gave me a great fucking... So, what happened is, the team became a uh, treasure drunk. Because they cast detect magic and they're realizing everything in the shop is magical, but yet they're getting like ridiculous prices. Like the gnome uh -huh. would be so absent minded, you know, that they were getting things for gold and silver that should have been thousands of platinum. They just got treasure drunk. The minute they leave the shop, everything disappears. And that all sucks. those items that's end up going that's... back into the shop. Only one of them had gone upstairs to see what was going on. They could see the kind of mummified body of the twin that's in the bed. And she comes down and she's like, uh-uh, we're getting the fuck out of here, right? So they all immediately leave. And then all their gear disappears. Mm -hmm. But what was happening with the other halfling is the halfling kept going. I, I, I took a, a line from 51st Dates. The halfling had a memory loss of every 30 seconds. <laughs> So he kept saying to like any of the player characters, oh, hi, good to meet you. What's your name? It's like, they, uh, that's like Mr. Like Short-Term Memory from SNL. Hey, yeah. hi. Oh, oh, there's something in my mouth. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and it was driving them nuts because they thought they were taking advantage of this poor, poor guy. So that is a morality theme. <laughs> yeah. The morality theme. Yeah. Well, but I just wrote down this wrong. idea that you sparked and I'm going to have to write this in somehow because it's, it's awesome. I don't want to give it away. And, and, you know, and that's why a lot of times when I write NPCs, I write them thematically as a moral question. Mm -hmm. So I'll look at an NPC and say, morality wise, what is the moral compass of this NPC? And that way, the moral compass becomes the guide for that NPC as they have interactions with the player characters. That way, without even realizing it, the player characters, for all they know, could be building a big bad because of the way they, you know, um, you know play out their relationships with NPCs. But there are some NPCs that I had a great time with that just disappear into the ether of the campaign, right? And then suddenly reappear. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of uh, uh, Sam plays a character called Samara, who is a half-orc, um, who is now a priestess of the Ivory City, Ivory Heart City, and she's, you know, she's a priestess of this huge Luxodon community that has come back into existence. And she has a girlfriend called Talil, who's a tiefling. Mm -hmm. And that relationship evolved like 40 sessions ago. 
Okay. And then suddenly it came back into the sphere of things. But, you know, she's... So do you keep... Uh, see, you you put a lot more thought into it than I do, apparently. I just... I just... I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I, a, I feel 30. like I'm much more superficial now. It's like, oh, you... Uh, welcome to the shop. You need some armor tonight. Sure, sure. And then it's a... <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's circumstantial. <laughs> it is circumstantial. Yeah. So, I mean... so given that, do you develop a compendium of your PCs. And I'm not talking about just templated, like, are you a DM and you need a PC here? You or an, you know, an NPC, both. here you go. But, but a, okay. But a compendium, you know what I'm talking about? A compendium mm -hmm. where it's like, this is a person. Actually, that's, that's, that's a good bridge right there. At what point does an NPC become a personality? I think a lot of that has to do with the way the player characters immerse that NPC into the narrative yeah. and the overall scope of the campaign. Yes, and I right. and I find there's been times. There's been times, and you're absolutely right. I'm using a very sterile form of a <laughs> of an NPC. I'm using a very sterile NPC. Yeah, but the players have so much fun. I'm like, oh, I'm going to rethink this now. Exactly. I was just going to say yeah. when I I find myself depending on the interaction. You know, if it's if it's a if it's a and I. I default to the to the shop owner because that's the easiest, you know, let's face it, that's it the easiest NPC. Yeah. But, you know, if it's a basic like, oh, I need some armor. Oh, I got some armor here for you. It's a thousand gold. Thank you. Goodbye. You know, well, whatever. It's a, you know, shop owner. But on the, I'm on the real. How, I'm amazed at how often no one negotiates. Oh, my God. My players negotiate all the fucking time. Mine don't. And I don't it's know awesome. why. It's awesome. I told I you a few. Terrified. I told you a few sessions ago. Um. <laughs> we're playing Rise of Tiamat and they defeated one of the dragons and I decided um, I I shouldn't admit this but I was actually feeling a little bit lazy that night so I'm like you know what we're going to spend three hours rolling on the fucking random magic charts in the DM's guide literally and it was like and they but fucking loved it it was literally like three hours in a Vegas casino because I, I literally, it was like, roll on this chart, roll how many times on this? It was three hours, and they they then had to negotiate with an NPC that was in the book on which items they could take, which relics they could take. And I'm not kidding, it was three hours of, of that, and they, and they absolutely loved it. So I find that depending on my character, uh, my player's um, immersion into... The interaction with that PC NPC right. determines whether or not they go into my, you know, so-called compendium of personalities. Um, obviously, the well, ones the the role the you know the the RP sessions that go really well, even if it's just a shop owner, because again, that's the best tool for hooks for driving narrative. Right. But the ones that go really well that I that I find my players enjoy very much. I kind of file that away and put them into my my personality compendium, which is more than just I need a sh I need a fighter or I need a, a thief or an assassin. I actually find the easiest way <clears throat> to develop an NPC compendium is three three perspectives. Um, one way is to um, write a short, brief history of a town. Okay. And why that town exists. Okay. And then I write a short, brief history of any rel relative guilds that might be involved in that town. Okay. And then I write a quick, short history in regards to the region that it sits in and its relationship to the region that it sits in. And to a certain degree, that almost builds what I call the, mor the, the moral question, the moral theme. Okay. You know, now I can design a stack of about 20 NPCs with a certain kind of morality ready to go because of the fact they occupy that town. Okay. So the town sets the condition, the morality of those NPCs are influenced by that. And then that's going to come in direct conflict with the way the PCs choose to interact with those, you know, those NPCs. That's an interesting approach. And then, the, you know, and then how they interact with them become notes within the compendium. So like in one of my one note tabs, there's literally a tab called, uh, NPCs. Okay. And it's like a thousand long. 
and it allows me the opportunity to go in, drag it out, drop it into an active campaign if it suddenly has value. And then as the, if the PCs, if the players have a certain relationship with that NPC, I take notes to that relationship and then look at the morality theme of that NPC and tell my, and then I say to myself, would this NPC suddenly deviate a certain way because of that interaction? Mm. Whether that interaction was positive or negative is self-determined through the way that the PC immersion occurs. That Sounds way like I do very <clears throat> little writing because a lot of that doesn't have to organically evolve until they actually are in a game. Sounds like Westworld, bro. A little bit. <laughs> Self-evolving NPCs, right? Yeah. The idea yeah. that you just, but see, I do everything that way in my creations. Everything mm -hmm. about how I create is small framework. Yeah. Because well, you have from what from what I have learned. Whoop, what was that? Excuse me. <laughs> uh, from what I have learned of you, you are very meticulous and very methodical. Um, well, that's a dirty little secret. No, I'm not. It only I it only feels like I am because of the way I create. Okay. There's no well. way you can run ten get games and be meticulous and methodic. It's impossible. <laughs> you can't do it. You know, so <laughs> what I've done is I've recreated that way. And one of the ways that I manage my framework of NPCs mm -hmm. is the same way I kind of framework out everything else. Gotcha. It's always easier to pull from a pool of things ready to go. Oh, of course. I, I would say the one skill that I've done very well, both that I've learned professionally and through my life and through my bad life choices and my good life choices <laughs> um, is my adaptation skill. Okay. And it's that adaptation skill that makes everything look easy. It really is. You don't happen to have a stack of 20 to 50 NPCs in a compendium that you're looking to put together and publish, do you? <laughs> I'm working on it. That's one of my, that's one of my goals. Um, I've actually seen a handful. Of, I've downloaded a couple of those from uh, the RPG Guild. We got um, we, we to get our asses Guild. going on that. I know, we got to get going on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did download one at one point because I was eager to see other people's interpretive idea for mm -hmm. how NPCs could evolve. And I watch a lot of people who game and I get a feel for their relationship with NPCs. Mm -hmm. um, I, as much as I enjoy how Matt does his, mm -hmm. Matt creates way too much work. And he creates so much work because he knows his players love his NPCs. Yes. He knows they love his NPCs. Well, and the so viewers love always, them too. Well, uh, you know that's, uh, you know that to me that that's um, agnostic to the table. Okay. Right. To me, the table's the table. Um, if you watch how Laura and 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 Marisha just feed off of just tweaking Matt's nose with certain NPCs, because Marisha's like sitting there drinking coffee, playing with you know playing with their dog, their corgi. And Matt's probably struggling writing, right? He's over there <laughs> writing a mad, a mad dash on an NPC of evolution, right? I'm but gonna, a lot of I'm going to ask her if that's true, you know. And and uh, and, and I only know this because Callista does it to me all the time. But the most famous interaction that is the most honest interaction you can have, and I think it was in season two, because Caleb was obsessed with collecting books. Yes. Matt looked at Kayla or looked at Liam because Liam had spent almost that entire session mad grabbing books and yeah. Matt had run out of book titles. And, you know, Liam goes, just before I leave, I want to grab a handful more books. Matt just tilts his head and looks at him. Uh, sure. You find three books that, um, you know, one is on the mosquito insect larvae development of so he just grabbed a whole bunch of titles out of his uh -huh, ass. Uh -huh. And Liam just goes, okay, okay, I understand that. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? yeah, there's, that point. there's that point when you become your own self, kind of like creator of expectation. Um, and the illusion that the DM and GM gets to play through the narrative player character, mm -hmm. it's mostly illusion. I view the campaign holistically. For the most part. Well, I, depends, I, I, like to your point, it always no, you're right. On the DM. You're right, and I and I think to say, and I'm not I'm not backpedaling, but I but I think you're right. You make a good point. It, it, it's not. 
I think to say that it allows the DM to play is the is wrong nomenclature. I think it it allows the DM to interact and explore. Mm. Uh, would be more you know would be more accurate. Um, well, you know, it's a role play. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so I mean that's how the DM role plays is through NPCs. So so in a way. You know what? I'm going to backpedal on my backpedal. In a way, that is how the DM gets to play with the players is through that interaction and through that role playing, which I happens through. I think you're right. It's one of many different layers of the cake that yeah. you can use to yeah. do that. The question is, at what point do you inadvertently destroy continuity through a player character? To me, NPCs have to have a ubiquitous reality within the game their ubiquitous reality is if it, they are a narrative tool of the of the storyteller then you need to maintain the continuity of that and not fall in love with your narrative player characters and they must know that they are ai and sentient yeah. artificial beings and when yeah. they come to that realization they can't freak out <laughs> yeah well you I just know. keep coming back to Westworld. <laughs> That's it. Well, and, and, uh, some of my pop culture references come from <laughs> Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I enjoy playing against yes! one shot. Yes. Because he truly believes that. He loves <laughs> to be competitive at the table as a DM. Um, he knows that my style of play is sandbox. Mm hmm. And the reason why my style of play is sandbox, another dirty little secret, it minimizes the amount of work I have to do. It really does make it easier for me playing in a sandbox. Yeah. 90% of the time, the players are writing the outcome without even realizing it, that they're mm -hmm. writing the outcome. I'm just hey, taking I am, mad notes. I am, and... I am writing this homebrew. I have, when I write, and I don't, I don't consider myself a writer, okay? But I have taken it upon myself at times to write. And I my understanding is there are two types of writers. One mm. type that um, that writes very uh, linearly, okay? This happens, mm. this happens, this happens, this happens. And other the other type of writer is the type that has the overall plot and, but they're not sure how they're gonna get from point A to point B. And it mm. just kind of, you write as you go. I am I am that type. So this homebrew that I'm writing is very much... Is it the um, favorite one we were talking about? Yes. Okay. And I'm running two groups through it. And I'm very much using both of these groups to help me write it. Um, and once it's written, my intent is to publish it. Okay. But in terms of creating it, I have the overall um, mythos of the story and the overall story arc. But I don't know how the characters are going to get from, you know... You meet in a tavern to my it, what is in my head as the end, you know, boss battle, for lack of a better description. And I find very much that the players are helping me write that inadvertently, unbeknownst to them. You, and that side quest that I was talking about is a perfect example of that because it turned out so well that it forced me. They were so, my players were so immersed in it because I was able to give them a couple of NPC interactions that provided a, a uh, um, an interesting enough hook that they really got into it, and it just wrote itself. And like I said, it was four full sessions of story arc. Well, and I was like, I, this is fantastic. I so that's go, now in the story. I want us to go a little longer tonight, because... One of the things you brought up, which is the most important to me, one of the most important aspects. Well, first of all, you're a great writer. Second of all, you're a better artist. So let's be clear about that. Oh, um, thank you. To me. And uh, and I, I hate to cut us off, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you for <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. So. No, I'm good. Go you, ahead. Go ahead. You actually I'm good. bring up a really good perspective. Um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, next. Vince, that's a, that's a whole we'll that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah, but I will touch on that a little bit because it is very important from an NPC perspective. Yes, that, yes. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so my Monday night game, that's our live in studio game. Uh -huh. Currently, I only have three players. I'm hoping to grow it to five, but it's always hard to get live games going in person because there's so much more devotion 
required, you know, managing If you didn't time. live out in the sticks. I know. I know. It's a truism. Um, but <laughs> we're doing something very different in that game. Uh -huh. um, we're not using classes. We're not using levels. Um, we're, yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Um, the narrative PC is the dominant theme of the game and how they're narrating out within the game. So as the NPCs evolve, there currently is no arc in the Monday night game. There's no arc. At all. At all. So this it's is a I... complete free form, just correct. Correct. Okay. So there's no arc. Now there's a theme it's 200 years after the fall of Ekna. Most okay. of the legend and lore is canon. And okay. the only surviving individual from that time period, um, I'm convinced Jin is going to be the BBG. Um, the only <laughs> survivor from the from the canon lore is currently Pike, Proud, or Trickfoot. Okay. And she is elevated to a supreme status within her relationship uh, with Vasselheim. Uh, and her relationship with the Temple of Saren Ray, and she's now uh, uh, what they call it a um, a uh, a Don Marshal. She's now a Don Marshal. She sits at the council seat, and she made you, a promise. Uh, did you okay this with Ashley? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> and so the theory was <laughs> the theme was that Pike made a promise to her friends, and she made a promise to the world to not let Vecna happen again. So her obsession with a the theocracy within the Vasselheim context is the theme. So there's things like zealot behavior. There's themes like the distrust of the arcane. There's mm -hmm. themes of uh, guilds trying to attain influence and power. But what's going to happen is the players, um, I smell back that coming again. <laughs> that, that may be a different problem you have to look into, Vince. Um, so as the players move through this sandbox and through this world, they, in a sense, are organically developing, <laughs> in a sense, they're organically developing the arc. Okay, through their that's... encounters, through their influences, at some point, they are going to be the ones that create the arc without even knowing that they've done it. Very cool. I like and that. And the idea was to finally get rid of the last of the rails of the game, take the core mechanics that make sense to the game, and put all the narrative power back in the player character's hands so that it becomes a lot more productive for me to be a narrative DM. I, I, I feel like we need to have an episode that focuses on... You've mentioned a couple a few times about the, about the rails of the game and being railroaded down a path. Well, first I feel of like all... We, and I'm not saying that's... I'm not, I'm not calling you out on that. I'm just saying... I feel like that could be an interesting topic of conversation is how different approaches to the game as a, as a, as a DM, how well, the approach constrained, to game that you play. Well, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But how right. constrained are you by, and I guess, you know, I guess it depends on the, on the type of DM you are and how much time you have to devote, you know, I well, mean, some, some may call it being constrained by the rails of the game. Others might call it, I don't have time to write a whole, you know, fucking campaign. So I'm going to use a published, a published, uh, um, sometimes those apes need to be. <laughs> well, but I think I feel, that... I think I fall somewhere in the middle to be very honest with you. Well, um, I think to Vince's point about the trope of a tavern, mm -hmm. um, how many arcs can't be tropey, right? How many, themes become the trope and the theme of the trope has to exist because of what you're doing railroading is essential to a one shot you have to railroad a one shot yeah well okay but that's a different well yeah. but railroading is essential to a module um but i think once again if npcs are used in a very creative way it never has to feel like a railroad like well, you can you, you can say railroading that. is essential to a module only if you want to repeat it. Well, no, I you have I a very just... interesting view on what you said, where the players are basically writing the narrative under the guise of this very high level umbrella. Right. If you don't ever want to repeat that, then you don't have to be railroaded at all. Well, I mean, I think most modules 
are written very chapter-esque. Yes. And and they give enough options that maybe it's not going to feel railroady, but like when you read the Mad Mage, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or what's the one before Mad Mage? Um, uh, yawning, uh, the Yawning Portal, is it? Uh... Well, it, it's the centerpiece of it. Oh but my I always... god, I'm really having a fucking brain fart tonight on everything. Uh, me too, I'm going to go to my Vince, DVD. help us out here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm there. Mad Druid, thank you. No, no. Mad Druid, what? No. <laughs> so there's there's Dragon Heist and then the Mad Mage. Dragon Heist, yes, right. Dragon Heist, yeah. So the... Um, That's all part of the Yawning Portal. Uh, sorry, one of my tabs just collapsed on me and I don't know why. There it is. Um, so... So one of the things I loved about um, uh, Dragon Heist... Mm-hmm. For the first time, it was written in such a way that you could repeat that one a lot. And there are different outcomes to the different chapter narratives. But no matter what, the outcome of a chapter had to be reached. To continue the narrative, yes. Right. I mean, that's kind of unavoidable in a in a published module. Exactly. And that's why I'm saying that the whole idea that railroad is negative is once again part of that schism. To yeah. me, I don't. I I prefer the term linear because linear makes more sense, right? It, it's written I, in the linear. I don't. Fashion. I feel like I feel like real. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I think, feel like railroading is a negative connotation. It is. It is. is. I feel like it is too. You brought it up, dude. <laughs> well, no, no, but I think it's a good point because it it, it it lends to the idea of how we're utilizing NPCs to help define the narrative nature of the game because. I think you can have a combination of things mm -hmm. where once the arc is well established, you don't really have that much of a choice. You have to use certain tools in your toolbox to maintain some of that narrative. Well, but and and let me let me throw this out there: the whole side quest thing. So I am like, using. I, I, use, I do love me a good side quest. I, well, and so I've been running. Uh, Rise of Tiamat, okay, mm. for about two years now with the same group. Um, and I I like to, the way I storytell is I, I like to, I don't like to gloss over things. So uh, if you're familiar with the story, there is the, the 40 days that they are traveling via caravan under, under in disguise from Baldur's Gate uh, all the way up to Waterdeep. Right. We role played almost all those forty days because I wanted it to feel like a miserable, wet, cold slog on a muddy road. Okay, you know how Lord of the Rings, you know, Fellowship of the Rings starts very small, right? Yeah. And they're and the, and they're trying to get from the Shire to Bree, and that is like you know half the story. Okay, it's just the four of them. It's very little, and it ends up very big i love that 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 and technique that, and that so, technique is usually referred to as the heroic tale yeah right the and, heroic tale is what kind yes. of sets the condition yes so so we played almost every one of those 40 days um and i think it really oh, added a story hence why i've been running this fucking campaign for two years <laughs> the interesting thing is and again, it was mostly predicated on just very simple scheduling or whatnot. Somebody couldn't make it, so we didn't want to delve forward in the main story, you know, so we did a side quest. And it's been interesting because the way I operate, I think you're the same, the way I operate is everything has to be uh, – connected somehow so even if it's a side quest literally for no other reason than we're feeling lazy and we just want to do some battle mm -hmm. it has to be connected to the story otherwise the whole the whole narrative falls apart in my opinion that's my anal retentiveness um, so those side quests i feel you can put even on a published module and you know what depending on where it goes to your point, if the players are writing the narrative and that side quest all the all of a sudden becomes more than a side quest, so be it. It can still happen under the guise of the overall mythos of that particular module. But I think uh, I think it I is. Think, 
I think a clever way to that analogy, right, from a from a side quest perspective, um, and, and I have a similar fashion to the approach when, mm-hmm. when this is going to sound so cheap and dirty, but my favorite little side quest thing that Matt was doing in season uh-huh. two was the inept hunters and the inept um, uh, bandits. <laughs> that Love that was guys. great because it was not <laughs> tied in to anything. It was yes. an opportunity for Matt to have a little fun with the idea that in an open world, you could run mm-hmm. into something quite nefarious that has nothing to do with the main arc. Exactly. And it can have its own terminus. Exactly. Um, it could have its know, own like, terminus or it could plant the seed in the player's heads. Did that, does this have something to do with the main story? And I am, and to, um, to Vince's point, I'm an evil motherfucker because sometimes <laughs> I'll create so much paranoia uh-huh. through these unthreaded arcs that just seem to happen that like in our denizens and masters game, right? We're going on two years. Um, and we've, met for a hundred sessions so far close to a hundred sessions it's kind of where i am with our yeah yeah mid-tier like at at, mm-hmm. at a point they'd be most <laughs> trend <laughs> you know at most as i as i drive the mpc concept right and that mpc concept is so deeply in tune with creating the idea of paranoia that when my poor players finally realized they had a small victory within the game, they didn't feel relieved. They were like, <laughs> we played for three hours and we get to the end of the session and everybody's leaning into their cameras waiting for it to happen. Mm-hmm. And then I go, okay, well, when we come back, uh, we're going to do a five month time skip and we're going to do this, this. And they're like, <laughs> what, what just happened? You know, and they're like completely paranoid. They're completely five months like, time skip. Just, just you know, I, my eye starts they beat, to twitch. They kind of, they closed the obsidian gate. They kind of beat the big bad. Um, the big bad's on the run. Uh, the siege of Nicodronus, you know, gets rid of Shulaman, and Nicodronus is back in the control of the Kovas Conclave. Um, uh, you know, the all of this shit plays out, um, and they're like. Did we win? We didn't win, but it, did we win? We didn't win, <laughs> but did we? Did we win? And it's like you know. And then they get patroned, and you know the whole next set of the arc is going to go on, which could be another year, you know, of doing it. So, oh. you know, sometimes those NPCs have so much more value, yeah, in creating one simple level of tension that. Every time they come in contact with all my NPCs, they're just like, huh, twisting their well, hair, biting their nails. And they're like going, I don't know. Do we, I got to feel like if we just kill this guy, we might win. Should we just kill this see, guy? That's, I told you. <laughs> I, so we're in the same place. Cause I told you my players are convinced everybody they meet is out to kill them. And 95% of the time it's true. So <laughs> I keep them on their well, toes. You know, taking the high road. <laughs> in a game that has such a, a I know you know it's like it's one of the reasons why I love to use the moral compass within yeah. the theme of an NPC because that moral flavor and that moral kind of conjecture that you put up for interpretation there's five people at the table that you're going to interpret either uniquely mm-hmm. or they're all going to equally have come together so well with each other that they're going to feel like they're all going to have the same reflective response to that moral, you know, interpretation. You know, that's another, I'm writing this down right now. Um, that's another, uh, that would be another good topic for a show is, you know, on that, on that level, when does the game cease to be a game in terms of, you know, when does it cease to be like watching a, uh, you know, a Disney fantasy movie versus um, a, you know, uh, Martin Scorsese fantasy movie where it just becomes so real and so, uh, not real, but so. Um, no, I get your point. 
it, it angst so... inducing, you know, where it where it see and I'm not I'm not I'm asking the question. I don't have the answer because I'm not saying that one is bad um and one is good um because we've obviously seen through critical role that the game can be so deep, so incredibly deep. And I guess it depends on your players and the and the and the you know what you decide with your table beforehand. But um, you know, at, at, like I said, at what point does it stop becoming we're playing a game and we're really you know we're really getting into some deep psychological I, and moral I and think ethical. It should, I think, and we can tie this back into <laughs> how you use NPCs to manage it. Um, but I, I think the discussion of the game will be another topic and we'll talk about the, yeah. the idea of the game and what the yes. intended purpose yeah. of the game is. Yeah. If I feel like the game is steering away from the fun factor, I'll mm -hmm. use NPCs to steer it back into the fun factor, regardless mm -hmm. of what I have to sacrifice within the content of the campaign. If I gotcha. know my players aren't having fun and it feels like it's work, I've done something I'm wrong and, I, and I've got to go a different direction. I'm not necessarily talking about that it's becoming work. If it's becoming work, that's a huge issue. And you got to be is, careful it, it's with a game. how deep the emotion gets within the gamification yes. of yes. what you're doing. Yes. So I think from a balanced perspective, you should be using your NPCs to create real immersion emotion that yes. help people feel invested in their time. Mm -hmm. But that time investment should always be fun. Absolutely. And that time investment should always be about mental health. And that time investment should always be about the hour and not the me. As Absolutely. long as that's happening, everything's working correctly. And I think NPCs play a significant role in that approach. Right? Because yeah. there's an NPC. Uh, I know Trend might be watching, but there's an NPC in her game because she's in one of my games. There's an NPC in there that everybody hates. They hate this guy. They're like, can't we just, they just hate this guy, but yet they've never really had an opportunity to deal with him yet, but they know that he's a mate. Well, they think he's a major <laughs> player as a, as an NPC, big bad. Um, mm -hmm. but there's this whole orchestration. There's this whole thing that's evolving around them and they're just kind of making their inroads, but their investment means that they're having fun and i can't do that without npcs i can do it to a point yeah but without npcs i can't do it at all so back yeah. to vince's original point um in regards to um uh like in regards to like the the trophy tra tavern right mm -hmm. well not every town like I, there's always ways to deal with that it's the npc that really helps us kind of flavor that in a way that can make it kind of fun. So it's not obviously tropey. <laughs> I'm punching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got no exactly. time though. I just punch. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, so the bartender says, would you like any drinks? I punch him. I, I roll initiative. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it, it really helps solve NPCs help solve the trope problem. They really can help solve it. You know, even if you decide the best they way can, for your party. They can solve it or they can add to it. <laughs> right. They, they can do both. And if the yeah. players all decide to meet in a tavern, you know, you meet yeah. in a tavern, there's a whole <laughs> lot of flavor. You, <laughs> you, there's a whole lot of flavor you can put into that to make it interesting so it doesn't appear tropey. Yeah. Um, I think a trope only ever really becomes a trope when it's constantly reused in verbatim. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when it's used in such a way that it's become an obvious crutch yes which npcs could easily fall into absolutely you know, uh, like i hate the idea of them walking into only one store to solve all their problems i'm not oh, a fan God. of that no 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 but i see people i do make them i make them run all easy. over fucking town there's no costco some, in my world my favorite is when they run into a town that has no shops just to, that just too have, and they're trying to buy armor from the, from the from the from the blacksmith who shoes a horses and and yeah and it doesn't have an inn it just has a tavern yeah it's, it's a small ramshackle tavern that serves piss beer <laughs> you know and the first thing they do is they look around and go okay well let's move on to the next one mm -hmm. but yet if they do that <laughs> there's be... nobody to kill here <laughs> but if they do that they might miss something uh-huh 
I will say this much out of all the campaigns that I've run over the course of 41 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not fair over the course of the 20 years that I felt very much invested in enjoying the game. Yes. Um, I would say only half of the contents ever revealed at most. Oh, easily. You know, in some cases, 30, 35% of the content. Yeah. And once an arc is established, I usually build about three to five finishing points to the arc once it's established. Interesting. So See, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite. I've, I'm kind of the, the school of thought where it starts here, it goes like this. And then it ends here. My end is always a little bit more concrete, but the middle is where it really can uh, spread out. Um, do Absolutely you guys feel disappointed? Not. If uh, yeah, I'm I never disappointed. I am always. My players always disappoint me all the time. <laughs> this is why I kill them left and right. Oh. No. Um, oh. <laughs> No, I actually, I do, I do get a little disappointed when, you know, if I've got a really awesome, um, if I've got a really awesome story element, yeah, and it's completely missed, I there's a little bit of disappointment there. I'll be honest. Really? Again, I don't. I think yeah. I solve. I think I solve that problem with myself by offering up five different ways something can end. Okay, so like I said, okay, so like I said, well, I mean that's fair, that's definitely fair. But I also get your point. I'm I'm empathetic enough to know that there was one time that I ever had that slight emotion. Uh huh. But it was an emotion because I do everything with um I do everything with milestone. Okay. So I've had campaigns conclude where people are only level sixteen or level seventeen, but it's they not they missed the other five milestones that were available to them. And those were heavily written. But are but you disappointed actually... because they missed milestones and they didn't reach the end game? Yeah, or are so you the, disappointed yeah, because more... they missed the content that you spent time no, creating? No, I'm the opposite. I'm more disappointed that they missed the opportunity to get another oh, milestone. Oh, no, see, in that, we are complete opposite. I don't give a fuck what their level <laughs> is. I don't care. Uh, I I sometimes, I get this point, I'm like, like, you know, uh, this is a really awesome arc. Ooh, Here's the hook. Do you level your NPCs? Do you put a level in mind sometimes? No, that I it's don't do. About that. that I don't do. I find it interesting that there's a leveling system for the player character, but yet we really don't bring it into context when we Well, I develop. think it's mal I think it's it is in, in the way I use it is I think it's malleable and I think depending on on where the characters are in their story um, and what their relationship is to the NPC, you just adjust on the fly. <laughs> if it's because I'm not Bioware, I can't write. <laughs> can't find... But no, I do. I I do get disappointed sometimes where I get really excited about oh, this is an awesome arc, and and they miss the hook and they go off on a tangent, and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> now it's like spending four hundred dollars on Dwarven Forge terrain, and the, and they just completely. They <laughs> completely bypass the encounter. <laughs> well, it's like in the Debtor's Gamut game that you're in, right? Yeah. When you and um, what's Calissa's? Um, uh, um, oh, Vince, help us out again. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, stop um, chasing the unicorn. The hook is over there. <laughs> um, there was something else that was there that, that didn't get. Um, Jewel. 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 Yeah. Um, there was something else there that no one found so am i disappointed not really um do i feel like the player characters would be disappointed if they found out what it was probably um don't reveal but, it you know it's like everything that happens in an open sandbox game mm -hmm. has has some kind of narrative value to it because if you find something in the open sandbox that may help you influence an npc's morality or the whatever morality that they've taken <laughs> that missed item could have swayed the nuance of something and something goes unlearned because of it here's the thing though the bottom line is if you're a good dm only you know what was missed 
or not missed. Only you know what was what was disappointing uh, because it was missed. Mm. If you are good enough at keeping the narrative going, then your players should never know the difference. Your players will never know unless you tell them, unless you blurt it out. Your players should never know you missed twenty percent of what I wrote. Okay, they should they should have a coherent narrative regardless mm -hmm. and they should enjoy themselves and i Which, think that kind of sums up what npcs really are is a is a tool to uh to affect that narrative um when it is appropriate and i completely agree with that 100 percent. yeah couldn't yeah. have said it better myself because to that point like our favorite reborn game when it when it ended right it was kind of sad because it was fun you were immersed you were completely you know you know invested in everything mm -hmm. and you know the i'm gonna miss some of those npcs because they were kind of fun there mm -hmm. was lord silverhand there was brackus there was you know lady kai and there are all these really fun npcs that had a lot of animus a lot of organ you know organic emotion involved with them mm -hmm. um but i think it really lends to the character of the pcs the players and how well they utilize those immersion effects yeah and fell in love with the npcs as well Callista tells me all the time she misses them yeah, yeah. i'm actually curious because i had this conversation with a different D, D stream but but being shenanigans or something serious what is your favorite moment with a reoccurring npc i i have to I don't know if I have a specific moment with a specific NPC, but I think the best moments still come back to like the shopping and the crazy shopkeeper. I I had an old gnome, Griselda's glorious goods or oddities, magical oddities, and she was a lot of fun because my characters were back at that shop numerous times looking for all kinds of potions and rings and and oh my god talk about negotiations those bastards were ruthless took me forever to get them out of the shop and, to um, Trin, and that's a good point because to trin's point is that when a an npc is really fun or very nefarious sometimes it's the the players fall in love with that npc exactly yeah and and again the most fun that i've had my favorite moments i I'm trying to think if there was if there was one particular moment and nothing comes to mind, but but I think it's a just a, a an aggregate of moments are again when we spend <laughs> basically any time in well absolutely I, well, I, yes absolutely and I mean that that is let's face it that's the ultimate goal okay with an NPC at least for me as a DM is when my characters are so, when my players are enjoying themselves and they get a laugh. That is the best moment. But to Trin's point, there is an NPC in the Age of Empire game that she's in. And he this NPC is this very kind of like uppity elven wizard that essentially treated one of the player wizards like he was dog shit. But did it in such a passive aggressive way that the wizard never was truly intending. He just assumed the player was um yeah <laughs> that the player was aware that they were you know he the, the the npc just would assume that the player was aware that they were dog shit yeah and therefore this should be no shock to the player but yet when another player within the group came to converse with that same wizard had a totally different experience because okay. that wizard realized that he was with somebody who was a bit more experienced more power had something interesting and didn't feel like an individual who was weak in power and just asking as opposed to, you know, trying to come up to an equal playing field. So now that these two players have had two uniquely different encounters with this NPC, <laughs> the banter is hysterical. It's yeah. absolutely hysterical. Yeah, Whether or I, not they ever go back to them. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't really. Well, matter you know, it's it... like you know, you could pick a different city, and it's like, oh, I'm on a, I'm on a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's a sales conference. Uh, strange meeting you here, and you know, 
I my favorite points are are just when the players really have a good time, and most of the time it's it's shopping, and it's like, oh yeah, we're going back to that shop. I will say there was one time, so they went to El Torrel uh, in Faerun, and the city is separated. There's a bridge across the river, um, and you enter the city basically over this bridge, and it's kind of separated by the river. And I I threw together these three dwarven brothers that had Russian accents. Mm. Although I'm going to say that they are Ukrainian, yeah, okay, for, yeah, for obvious <laughs> but keep it, was, it real, brother. It, keep it, it real. was Gregor, Sergei, and I in Ivan. Ivan. Uh, one guy was on; he was the ferry master at one end of bridge. His brother was at the other end of bridge, and then his brother was the tavern keeper. And and it was just off the cuff. They're like, okay, you walk into this place, and it's uh, this dwarf, and his name is Gregor. He's like, you know Sergei? Oh yeah, he's my brother. He works the ferry at the bridge. <laughs> My and they brother kept Daryl and my them. other brother Daryl. Exactly. And they kept <laughs> running into these guys <laughs> throughout their whole time in the city. And that was that was pretty fun because they were like, oh, yeah, I know you. And and yeah. yeah. Well, there's been a couple times where people like they'll openly ask the NPC, do you have a relative in this other Right. Right. like <laughs> You know, and then you got to, you know, then you're realizing eh, maybe I need to tweak that voice. Just a little bit to give it a yes. When a every bit. when every dwarf you meet is a Scottish bastard, you've got to, you've got to expand your, your repertoire. <laughs> yeah, the repertoire. <laughs> uh, I don't know why lately I've been deferring to my dwarves as as Russians. I I don't know I don't know. Where well, that, I think where it's I always that. well I think it's always the thick accent that kind of follows with it. it's lots of fun because i know you never have you ever met a, have you ever met a dwarf who was uh who was uh, a a noble or or of uh, you know soft spot no fuck no you've met the bastards are drinking under the table <laughs> <laughs> but depends i mean what if the dwarf was raised by elves doesn't matter he's still he's still got an attitude well, it's gonna have actually, the of an elf. Now, actually, uh, it's funny because my dwarven war mage, there's a uh, only once in <laughs> Fucking Vince. <laughs> Fucking Vince. Hold on, I gotta put that up there. That's too funny. Toodaloo, <laughs> motherfuckers! <laughs> Reminds me of Hangover 2. <laughs> right? Uh but yeah, it's it's fun. You know, that's another thing. Just the mechanics of NPCs. So I love doing voices and characters. Mm -hmm. The mechanics of NPCs. Let's get you know. Let's strip away all the deep level bullshit and just right. uh, just concentrate on the mechanics. It is difficult sometimes keeping them all straight and mm. not mixing accents and remembering who the fuck is who. <laughs> there are times when they've come back to an NPC after an extended period of time. And I have to stop and I go, oh, where was he from? Yeah. What, what accent was I using for that one? It, yeah. Which is why I tend to use a lot more voice inflection as opposed mm -hmm. to traditional accents. See, I do. I fall into the trap because I love doing them. I fall in the mm -hmm. trap of doing accents and I'm like, uh, and they're like, mm, weren't you from France last time? <laughs> now I do enjoy the fact that any of my games where they're in the Morrow Valley or within the Dwindalian <laughs> empire, mm -hmm. almost everything Zimian. Which is just really bad German accent. Well, yeah, of course that it is easy, but uh, you know, ja. but you still have exotic people from traveling from other lands, and you have to remember who is who ja. and ja. where they come from, and then this breaks my brain. Uh, this is true, but uh, to a certain degree, if you are from the northern motto, you may have a more high-minded notion of your accent. If they are from the southern motto, you might be a little bit more of deeper into your throat and don't even talk about those uh, dwindles that live up in the Tysis Beal. There's somewhere <laughs> over here that's just mad. But yeah, if you're from Zadash, you might be a little bit more knowledgeable of a lighter accent because we're civilized and we don't really give a shit about that. Um, but yeah, if you're in the Purbo where you spend a great deal of time in discussion with many different cultures, sometimes your inflection gets. Oh um, <laughs> sometimes your inflection. That is disgusting, bit, Vince. Yeah, it's horrible. It's Don't gross. ever say that again. It's terrible. We are a family show here. We will not have this on the show. <laughs> so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> this is so a kid show, you. you bastard. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but, and there are many times that you could express a different tonality to your voice 
and put it in a perspective of somebody who just enjoys looking down upon the lessers and have a little bit more. So you could take a single accent. Oh, of course. Create like a dozen ways of interpretive it. Of Absolutely. The yeah. It's and just then have a lot of fun with it. It's just, it's difficult. Like you said, it's difficult. You know, it depends on how deep you delve into your NPCs. You got to have like personality sheets because it's difficult remembering who the fuck is who. Well, and I think, um, I think with an NPC too, you want to be very tactful and mindful of cultural appropriation as well. You don't want to approach accents that you have either no knowledge or no skill of, right? This I is, mean, it's, well, yes, this is true. You know, it's like, I don't mind taking on a Southern accent because I have a cultural understanding through friends and people that I've met over the years in regards to that accent. And I feel like it's okay because culturally I've been involved with it, but I'm not going to understand, you know, I'm, there's no way I'm going to know the difference between the 138 <laughs> unique cultures within India Mm -hmm. to safely be able to use an Indian accent because I don't think that's... I don't uh, think that's now, see, here is where you and I different, my friend, because I will definitely delve into that pool with uh, head first without knowing the depth. I and, just don't feel uh, like not I... have a problem I, with it. You do it way better than I can because I just don't <laughs> feel like I can do it justice. That's have, what usually gives me pause. I have... Uh, I've been told... Uh, I'll toot my own horn a little bit. I've been told by by people from these cultures that my Indian is very good, my British... Well, I should say uh, my South London, particularly, um, is very good. I've heard my Scottish is good. I've heard... I always thought I did Australian, but turns out it's New Zealand. Um, it's, well, it's, it's, it, it's the nasal, right? Yeah. New Zealand is higher in the nasal. And I yeah, believe, something like that. I don't know. I just do it, but you know, whatever. And I think Ozzy is more in the drama. I'm out. probably actually somewhere in the middle of the ocean between the two, <laughs> but it's fine because most people don't know the difference. So well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know really what gives you calls in it. I mean, it, it depends on your perspective of where you where you're putting the words. I mean, if you're well, drawing out that, the uh, accent, so you're drawing out the the horrible English that we speak, you just it, call it Ozzy. <laughs> and you know what? I don't eat any fucking lobster. They and always say put a lobster on the barbie. I don't. What the fuck would you do that for? I mean, you're gonna dry out the meat. It's gonna taste like shit. You boil <laughs> lobster, you fucking idiot. Maybe in America, you 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 put lobster on the barbie. But out here in in Tasmania, which there's Tasmanian, there's New Zealand, there's Australia. Oh yeah, right. I know. You know. I know it. And it's all about what you do in the back of the throat when you talk like it's an old man. Too steep for a <laughs> Go wrestle Go a croc. Go fuck. wrestle a croc. Now it's an orc. Go wrestle <laughs> an orc. You that's the problem. Idiot. See, that's certain, and that's funny because certain characters, certain accents elicit an automatic result. Like everybody Scottish is in a bad mood and they swear a lot. That's every third word uh, that a fucking fuck dwarf says Christ is fuck this sake. and fuck that, and I'll have a fucking ale. And all I so, have to do is I gotta draw it out to be very long to put aye. emphasis on the fuck that you that you, you god damn it, motherfuckers, give me my stain. I don't want to be sitting here waiting for me fucking beer. Well, of course. I mean that's that's a yeah. given. That's yeah. a given. I mean well, any and, and, any and, and, whether it's an accent or anything, that's I, I, I have two horrible cheats that I fall back on because it's the most common NPCs that everybody runs into, which is a guard. Right. And just a standard shopkeeper. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to, to a certain degree, draw the line and tell yourself, uh, look, it's a sta it's a guard. And what's it's, like on, it's like on free guy. Um, yeah. I'd like to get into the city. Yeah. Holt, who goes there? Yeah. Um, I'm here to see Lord, uh, Lord so-and-so. He's not here. I am here to see well, Lord Well, I wonder Farquhar. if I could go to a shop. Holt, who goes there? <laughs> I'm here to see Lord Farquhar because he huffed and he puffed and he blew our house down. <laughs> Lord Farquhar. He's a, he's a real mean man. <laughs> you know. The politician's voice should always be very, like, kind of nefarious uh, without being obvious. I but think the guards, we should have, I the think guards we should... are a lot of fun, right? Because they're yeah. just English guards. You could be Absolutely. in the middle of, a, of like an elven town. And you almost always feel like you should default to an English guard. I know. It's so and there's stupid. There's been a couple of times when I <laughs> which, made that mistake. <laughs> which is no, why lately I've been trying, Bacqua. which is lately why I've been trying to default to other accents that may not have anything to do with the, the, the trope stereotypical you, background of, of Have you ever tried to make or, up your own accent? Have you ever thought about yeah and you know what and and i'm not this is it's gonna hard. sound 
this is going to sound conceited in a way, but because I'm so good at doing accents, I can't make up fake ones mm. because it always it sounds, always it always picks up the nuances of an actual accent. Well, so is it is Grog, very, is Grog an accent or is Grog just being an idiot? No, Grog's just being an idiot, but he pulls right. it off perfectly. Right. So I'm just saying, I'm not always sure that I wiped front to back. Uh, well, I mean, you could say that it's a bit of an English one, but he doesn't go so far as to, right. you know. I mean, if you're really talking South London, then you're not going to fucking understand half the fucking shit they say. see, that's a good orc accent you're using. Right. Too. That's yeah. a good one. Because, I, you know, I'm having fun with the Lord Estro's character in Mercer's current game because I kind of been treating my orcs that way a lot, where they're, yo. Just because we're bred differently doesn't necessarily mean Me too. that we're not high-minded enough individuals goblin. to understand the perspective of things. You're feeling or, goblin? Oh, fuck. I'm or like a goblin. Or a baritone halfling. Right, right. <laughs> you know, a, a halfling that's down here. Oh, it's good to see all of you. This three-foot guy with a big baritone voice. And, and that's As why opposed I... to the typical halfling that's seems to always be right. slightly high on meth and, and interested the... <laughs> in having a slight conversation with you. Oh, hi. Are you here to buy my wares? Oh, well, come on right into my shop. I've got shoes. I've got necklaces. I've got freeze-dried goblins. You know, I've it's funny you bring shit. that up because I... Whatever I've... you want, I got it right here. It's, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I had halfling. a halfling just last night. I was running the game and I had a halfling shopkeeper and that's pretty much exactly what she sounded like, but... <laughs> but that's why I've at least with dwar dwarves have become my favorite race for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm short, but um, they're fun. <laughs> but, they are fun. But I've but I've been really trying to stay away from. Like I said, I've been trying to stay away from the the Scottish dwarf. Um, you know that's why in your campaign he's doing a, he's a little different. So his tribe, you know, his clan is from somewhere else. Doesn't matter. Well, and I'm wondering. Well, I'm wondering. Cut me crackhead, doesn't... Jesus. And I, and I think this, I think one of the, um, yeah, I know the essentially comic Cockney crackhead. Right. I mean, I've got a, a, a Scottish group I love to fo follow called Make This Epic. And it, I follow them purely because they're all Scottish mm -hmm. and they all play D&D. And it's funny. Oh my God. I fucking love that. I've got to see that. Send me the link to that shite because yeah, I've got I to fucking watch that now. And, and it's really fun because I love it when they try to do American accents because it's kind of like when Liam Neeson tries not to be <laughs> Irish. Hi, this is most inappropriate. I have a set of skills. Yeah, I, I'm from fucking New Jersey and I have a set of skills <laughs> that put me in a different range and I'll fuck you up, you fucker. <laughs> well, and it's like, you know... One of the things I love most about NPCs, and I know we've, only got, we've got about 20 minutes before we wrap it up, so I'd love to talk about this. The one thing I love most about oh, we go. Are we going two hours tonight? Yeah, might as well. I think we jumped the shark about 10 minutes ago. I know. Sure, but, let's go. <laughs> but one of the things I really love to do with NPCs is by practicing them and doing some well and doing some poorly. Yeah. It really kind of helps the players try to, do voices as well try to get into their character try to take some of that risk because they mm. realize their dm and the storyteller is being vulnerable and being creative and trying to create this really kind of cool way to trigger their role-playing responses through being able to realize oh well he's playing out a totally different character right now and he's mm. doing this in such a way it gives me some freedom you know it gives the player some freedom and some availability to really get into it and and experience like so when trin plays her character oh he's got that bit of an elven accent of you know i'm educated and i'm better than you you know there's um uh uh uh, uh quill you know who's tia zimian and has a very thick zimian accent and then there's you know uh corwin's character he's a fucking redneck he was raised in <laughs> the woods and he's treated appropriately and then you have the wonderful way that Ilsa is played with absolutely no dwarven accent because yeah. you begin to realize it would probably just make her feel uncomfortable. So she's playing it the way that gives her joy and passion towards it. 
And then it's there's so- um Elof who's playing so out in the woods, you know, that old saying that bears shit in the woods. Well, of course they <laughs> shit in the woods. They're in the woods, you know. I shit in the woods because I'm in the woods, but just because Goliath shit in the woods doesn't mean that you're just gonna be that's all funny all because stepping in shit. <laughs> it's it's funny because you say uh you know i mean any so i guess we're on the topic of accents now which is fine because i love accents and well, what, i think but, npcs value accents yeah, yeah. well it's, the it's of the game, i think the easiest you know? the easiest um uh explanation is because it sets them apart Mm-hmm. You know, otherwise it's like, oh, you walk into a store, it's an elf, but I sound like this. And now you walk into another store and it's a dwarf, but I sound like this. It sets them apart and it sets the scene, the scene. Yeah. Um, and it's that immersive uh, aspect. But it's funny because um, I loved when uh, Travis did Ford with his... Uh, with his Bronco accent? Yeah, with his uh, uh, Eldritch Blast. Um, yeah, well, so and it, right and you, don't think, hips, you don't think of D&D... You don't think you don't think of D and D as as anybody having a southern U.S. accent, but I, it was fucking hilarious. And I I have I tell you one thing, I've always wanted to play a fucking dwarf from fucking New Jersey. You know, like how you know, fucking out of how out of theme would that be? But how fucking funny would that be? I mean, come I, on. I don't think it's out of theme at all because I think it'd be great. Within- My next fucking dwarf character is gonna be from from fucking Jersey. I tell you that. <laughs> It's <laughs> oh shit, do it. Yeah. So uh, I need a fucking battle axe. Uh, what it, 10 gold? What the fuck? Come on, I'll tell you what. Hey, Why don't you give me that axe for hey, five or I'll bury it in your fucking head? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be a Yiddish grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lay it on me. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm g- <laughs> I'll I tell you what. I don't care about your battle axe that you need. Down here, when you're down I'll south, tell you what, I'm going to cast magic missile, but I don't remember the components. I got the thing. <laughs> I remember the. I remember how to do the fingers, but mm. I'm looking in my bag. I can't find the components. I'm not sure I can do the spell. You know what? Fuck it. I'll just uh, for, forget about it. Forget See, it. Now, don't worry now, about it. Now I want your dwarven. I want your dwarf to die, and I want you to be a halfling Yiddish caster. Oh, my God. Wait, that would be that, fucking hilarious. Where did my components go? That right. would be oh, yeah, hilarious. It was just yeah, a minute ago. I think that's I, I want to cast. I want to cast slow. I can't find the molasses. I got it in here in the bag somewhere. It's got stuck. It's all the fucking lint is on there. And I got my glasses and my coins and I don't know, but I can't find the molasses. I but guess I, think, I can't cast that spell. So you know what? Fuck I, think, it. I think it goes back to the point when if you try to create your own accent, there's no reason to because now you can use dialects. Right. You can use like um, uh, the what's the Louisiana dialect? Um, um, OK. Uh, Creole. Okay. Creole. Creole and Cajun, right? There's Cajun, there's Creole, there's obviously there's a heritage of French heritage down there in the mix of English, French, and you know, the, the Americanization of mm. language within those kind of boundaries as well. You know, you can <laughs> say the same thing about the South. They call it the shallow south, the deep south. Oh, of course. There's two you know, the, and well, and it's see, it's very interesting. So I I I I fancy myself as a student of of dialects and accents because I have a very I've just had a very good ear my entire life even as a kid mm-hmm. I could watch somebody on a movie doing an accent and immediately pick it up mm-hmm. and um I've always prided myself on that and there yeah there is a there's a huge range of specific dialects within like you said like you know you think New York well New York New Jersey Queens Bronx are all very different the south oh, yeah. You know, Alabama, Texas, Carolinas, you know, Arkansas, very different. There's a ton and I, uh, and I of think dialects. that's okay to bring and that's in all over your, the world. Yeah, and I think it's okay to bring into your fantasy game just oh, because they're in an empire of dwarves doesn't mean every single dwarf within the empire are the same. Exactly, which is exactly why I was like, yes, my clan, you know, we are from the ma- the Sunrise Mountains over here. And, uh, you know, we broke away from uh, Dwarven society because we did not like those, them. So. Those hildrods, you know, they're always stealing my socks. <laughs> Dwarves wear socks? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That, I don't, I that's the topic for next kept, week. Do Dwarves wear socks? My, they kept stealing my socks. So I don't I'll know tell you something, you. though. If nothing else we take away from this hour and 45-minute show... 
the only thing is that the, my next character is going to be a Yiddish halfling because, I mean, my God, come on, really. It's, it's just it's gotta so happen. obvious. It's got to happen. I love it, especially the magic user. Like the, I can see it now, like my grandfather. It's just, I, can't, I can't find anything here. That's going to be, I'm going to write him up tomorrow. That's my next character. I may even change in your campaign, so be ready, but we'll see. I don't know. Well, and and an NPC in any game you play, whether it be sci-fi, whether it be you know the Masquerade, Cthulhu, um, D and D, whatever game you're playing in, if you're a storyteller, a DM, GM, um, GM, DM, Dungeon Master is kind of ubiquitous to the to the D and D thing. I've always preferred to say GM game, you know, just from a gaming perspective. But mm -hmm. always practice it. Just practice it. It doesn't hurt. You what do you think I, mean? I do in the car when I'm by myself driving around in the car? It's all I fucking do all the time. <laughs> and I think making up an accent, I think, is going to be key. I think it's going to be one of the things I'm going to work on. I'm just going to mix, mix some it's accents tough. I'm telling you, it's and... tough for me because it always, it always falls into, I always pull from something. It's hard for me to make one up. Well, it makes you wonder if one's even capable of being made up. I mean, if there's such a huge variety out there that can already be pulled from, probably doesn't need to be made up. No, so. and you could mix a couple, but that's even that's difficult. I always, I've uh, always admired like like voice coaches and linguists and and accent yeah. coaches. Yeah, well, I, I think that was always my attraction to reading The Hobbit when I was super young. Mm -hmm. Is that you begin to realize that Tolkien developed languages. Oh my literally god! Literally yeah. wrote yeah. unique languages. Yeah, you know the orcs had their unique language. The elves had their yep. unique language. He wrote unique languages that that then became a part of the story. And yeah, his linguistic nature and the way. Oh my god! It was language fantastic. was so important. You know the it, depth it, of it, of those dictionaries is it's oh, freaking amazing. It's nutty, it's nutty. Yeah. All right, are we ready to wrap it? Yes, I think perhaps. I mean, we spent a lot of time. It's Friday night. I got the Sabbath. I shouldn't even be doing this. I'm working here. So you know what? We've gone way over. It's way past sunrise, sunset, whatever. Anyway, um, thank you all for joining us. Next time we'll talk. What are we talking about next time? We're going to have uh, Callista on as a yeah, guest. Yeah, we're going to have, we're going to talk about player characters. That's we're right. Talk about Today, NPCs next week. Play, player NPCs. characters. So, Very good. Yeah, and we absolutely. look forward to having the guest. Um, let me throw this out there for you. Um, we're thinking about changing. Are we thinking about changing nights from Friday? Maybe, but we'll have to plan that out. So All right, I think we'll talk about the, that for I now. For the remainder of this month will be Friday nights. Uh, when we go to talk about our April schedule, we'll take a look at that and see what we have available. All right, sounds good. So. Then for now, join us next Friday. We talk about player characters. We're going to have a guest on. It's going to be wonderful. And uh, work on your, your backstories and your accents. Yeah. No That's shit. all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody. Thanks. All right. Good night. Thank you, Jason. You Thank bet. you all for joining us in chat.